Hey, everybody. How you doing? OK. How many people in this room know all about nuclear energy and nuclear power? Right. I see like five of you, maybe. Cool. Everyone here today is going to learn a little bit. I can guarantee it. I've learned a ton this week just trying to even understand the context of how to present this to you. So here's what we're going to do. There's no way I could do that, though. I am nowhere near an expert on that. The good news is, as is always the case with the University of Michigan, we know an expert in the area. So she's been kind enough to come in here and join us today. While she was an undergraduate at some school down south that we beat in the college football playoff this year, she developed a novel solvent system for CO2 absorption. While she came up here to do her master's in public policy, she was a graduate student instructor for the infamous Jim Duterstadt, which is the namesake of the building that a lot of you probably hang out in. She was a Dow Sustainability Fellow at the Graham Institute, and she taught calculus at Ross. After that, what she do naturally? You go to the White House, and you go work in the Office of Science, Technology, Policy, and Innovation. She is an incredibly innovative force, bringing highly adaptable, modifiable, cost-effective technology to probably the most heavily regulated industry in the world. She's an impact-oriented leader, decarbonizing our planet as we speak, and she formally goes by Michelle Brechtesbauer. Please help me welcome. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Get some thumbs ups. Awesome. Cool. Um, well, hi. Yeah, I'm Michelle Brechtelsbauer. I'm Vice President of Strategy at Last Energy. I'm really excited to be back at Michigan. I literally never thought that I would be teaching a class, um, so this is really cool for me. Um, so as Eric mentioned, my uh, early career was really at the intersection of science and policy. As an undergraduate, I studied chemical engineering, where I learned basic problem-solving skills that I could apply to you know, large-scale challenges, um, apply my own creativity, but also that scientific rigor. And then as a graduate student here at the University of Michigan, I studied public policy, where I was able to translate or learn the tools to translate science insights into actionable policy recommendations. So from there, I, after grad school, I moved to Washington, D.C., where I started my dream job, uh, supporting the Office of Science and Technology Policy and later the Science and Technology Policy Institute to coordinate federal science policy in the environment and energy space across our government. And about four years into that role, I started to get really jaded. I started to become frustrated by the slow pace of bureaucracy, the lack of climate action or really energy policy at all. Um, and I was mostly frustrated by my own inability to make that direct impact that was what brought me to Washington, D.C. in the first place. I wasn't in control. So at that point, I realized that the intersection I was at had a traffic jam. And uh, it was around then when I got an opportunity to look at a new lane. And that was when Brett Kugelmas, the uh, founder of Energy Impact Center and eventually Last Energy, reached out to me and offered me the opportunity to help him build a company. So as I was preparing for this uh, conversation with you all today, I found myself reflecting on why <laughs> I chose the decision I made to join a startup as the first employee. Um, and it reminded me of this TED talk from 2010 called How to Bo Build a Movement. It's really short, it's only three minutes long. Highly recommend you look it up later um, if you're in the startup space. But the key premise is that to build a movement requires a leader who's willing to stand out. In this case, a shirtless dancing guy. Um, but the other important lesson is about the first people that follow that leader, the first follower and the team and eventually the other dancers that join him in this field. They're the ones who have the courage to make it safe for others to follow. And I think it's an apt analogy for startups, founders, and early teams as they think about building relationships and managing those relationships, especially when they're trying to transform an industry or disrupt something that's been highly established. Last Energy, in a nutshell, is a micro-modular nuclear power plant developer that 
is bringing clean baseload heat and power directly to industrial customers through an energy as a service business model. Five years ago, when we started to build this company, we were focused on what it would take to truly address climate change. And we recognized that getting to net zero wasn't going to be good enough. To truly address climate change requires abundant, affordable, low carbon power. And that's where we started to look at nuclear energy. So we did a survey of all readily available technologies and were wholly convinced ultimately by the superiority of nuclear power based on its sheer physics alone. So our mandate is to ensure that not only can we increase the amount of nuclear energy, but we also are doing it in a way that enables human flourishing and allows us to have a future where we don't have to rely on new technologies that might not come to be. So that's why we're focused on this early technology. So what we did to start to look at this space is try to understand why the industry was at the place that it was about five years ago. So the first thing that we did is we essentially started talking to subject matter experts. We spoke to hundreds of folks that we um, ultimately recorded into a podcast series called the Titans of Nuclear Podcast and eventually another podcast called Energy Impact. And the fundamental thing that we learned, there was, there was a challenge for the industry where we had seen its history had been marked by stagnation, by fits and starts, relegating nuclear's contribution just 10% of global energy supply was that most of the innovation had been focused on the reactor itself. And when you focus, when your approach is focused on that fundamental piece, you introduce a lot of complexity. So what that did is over time, nuclear power plants became larger and larger, more bespoke, complex, leading to time and cost overruns and ultimately requiring governments to foot the bill. When it comes to technology, there are two main approaches, to design bigger and more customized reactors or to fundamentally change the physics and chemistry. And that's the way that the incumbents in this space have been approaching it. But what happens when you do this is you introduce a lot of risks, right? You have supply chain availability issues. There's fuel is a, is a big critical um, item for this sector. There's regulatory unfamiliarity when you change the physics and chemistry, and that can also ultimately lead to longer timelines, operational uncertainties, and inflated costs. So what we wanted to do when we are focusing on this area is look outside of the reactor. Keep the reactor the same, but focus on optimizing the energy system that's required to deliver that. So what we did is we came up with a unique set of engineering efforts to optimize around these characteristics. How can we ensure that licensing is as efficient as quick as possible? Um, so we stick with the standard technology that regulators are accustomed to. We ensure that we use robust supply chains that everything in our power plant exists today. We ensure that we're using standard operational practices that are also accepted by the regulatory community. And ultimately, this is going to help us reduce cost of capital, help us productize and standardize a design that can be optimized for high throughput manufacturing. And we didn't just look at the technology, we looked at how we actually deliver this as well. So this is another core innovation of Last Energy, is switching to a delivery, um, a delivery model. So what we've done is set ourselves up not just as a reactor vendor or a nuclear power plant designer, but we are actually an independent power producer. So we do everything from design the technology to license and finance our projects with customers, and then go out and build, own, and operate those assets. Um, so what that means is we're looking for customers, energy users, that lack an alternative to grid power. They are often looking for baseload clean electricity, we call this firm or 24-7 electricity, um, in increments of 20 megawatts, 200, uh, up to 200 plus megawatts electricity. Um, and some example applications of the customers that we've been working with to date are data centers, chemical manufacturing uh, facilities, district heating, um, and, and really any manufacturing process. So here is, uh, uh, some, I'm gonna go through a few pictures of what our technology looks like and what it ultimately will look like. But what we've done from the tech side is designed a system that is fully modular. A lot of you probably are familiar with the concept of modularity. So for us, it means designing it such that each piece of kit can be put into a standardized steel structure, 
those structures are fabricated in the factory setting, delivered on site, and ultimately assembled just like a Lego kit. So what we've done here is essentially take a power plant and turn it into a standardized product. We've also shrunken it down though to a size that works with our business case as well and physically is implementable more appropriately in these environments next to energy users at their sites or near their sites. So the footprint of our plant is also really small. It's about a third of the size of a standard football pitch or in the US soccer uh, pitch. Um, it's really sleek design. You wouldn't think that this is a nuclear power plant. So where we are today. So in 2023, we started to go out to market with this product, um, focusing first on Europe. We can talk more about how we got there um, in the Q&A. Um, and we have since signed power purchase agreement deals uh, with eight first mover customers, representing over $30 billion of future electricity sales, um, or 51 of these little power plants. Um, we're focusing in the United Kingdom, Romania, the Netherlands, and Poland to start. And I think that is the end of my slides. Thank you, Michelle. I feel equally educated and dumb because I don't, I don't know anything about nuclear. It's not my area. I know nothing of this. I so. knew nothing about nuclear energy before I started, aside from the policy angle, before I started at Last Energy as well. well. You know, let's talk about that here. So you knew nothing of it, but somehow you got to nuclear. Yeah. How's that go? You know, um, it's interesting. I get asked that question a lot by new employees that started our company. We have kind of a philosophy where we don't like to hire folks from the nuclear sector. We'd like to hire folks from outside of the nuclear sector, um, particularly the power generation space um, or the renewables sector where they've built things. <laughs> um, nuclear, as I mentioned, is a stagnated industry. We don't build a lot of nuclear power plants today. Um, we do operate plenty, but in, in terms of the, the phase where our company is at, we want builders. Um, so when new employees start, I often encourage them to go on this same journey that we went through, where we were recording all these episodes of Titans of Nuclear and Energy Impact. You know, obviously they can listen to those, but doing your own research really ultimately will convince you a lot more of the, the merit of the technology. And what it also instills is, you know, a fundamental sense of, of, of passion for the mission that we're ultimately trying to build. Okay, okay, I get that. So let's set some context around yeah. what this is operating in, some context around world energy consumption. You can speak to this probably better than I can, but essentially what we're showing here is the notion of energy demand increasing tremendously, especially for electricity production, mm -hmm. a primary source of energy use. And when we're looking at this, the increase in renewables, even though it's incredibly small now, is a multitude bigger than what we've had in mm -hmm. the recent two decades in nuclear. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, nuclear energy, I guess it starts in 1995, right? So um, kind of the, the build out heyday of, of nuclear was in the 60s and 70s. So the nuclear power plants that are operating kind of at this stage towards the end are really the ones that were built in that time period. So really all you're probably seeing is a decrease of those that have kind of come to their end of lifetime. Um, so yeah, we, we really haven't built much new nuclear in this, this time period, aside from Vogel in Georgia, in the United States, and then a few other countries have had some big programs too. Okay, and, and, and to kind of drill down further into that, and to your point about nuclear not being built, not being mm -hmm. increasingly added to the energy consumption production mechanisms, yeah. kind of illustrated here talking about really the small amount yeah. that has been added, 11 yeah, but per what's year. cool about this graph, right, is what we're also seeing is some really excellent innovations in the solar and wind space that are seeing a lot of increases, right? So in the same time period is when the power purchase agreement model um, was kind of established and took hold. So this is the idea that you can build a power project and then sell that power, that electricity directly to an energy user, be it the grid or to a specific off-taker um, that needs that that set amount of power, and that's what the renewable sector pioneered, and that's the business model that Last Energy is bringing to the nuclear sector. Aha, uh -huh. okay, yeah. so let's talk about the Titans of Nuclear podcast. So now that that context is set, there's uh, an epiphany-like moment to be had by Brett and, and you and the team about what could be done with Last Energy. Talk to us a little bit, what does that look like? How does that start? Yeah, I mean, we really did spend the first two years of the business 
just talking to people, not talking ourselves, right, and listening, uh, trying to understand, you know, what were the historical mistakes that we could learn of from the nuclear space. But we weren't just talking to folks in nuclear, in the nuclear industry, we were you know, talking to regulators, policymakers, technology vendors, um, EPCs, or and, uh, uh, engineering procurement construction firms, um, trying to avoid acronyms for you guys. Um, you know, those folks involved in the nuclear space. We were also talking to, you know, the pioneers in the renewables industry and um, financiers and bankers and people who were really could kind of point at the big problems that were stagnating the industry. And like I said, from the nuclear side, we really just heard this overemphasis on changing the reactor physics, right? Every new nuclear plant had something fundamental difference. We weren't learning, we weren't standardizing from one design to the next. Some countries have done this well. Um, so if you look at the, the build out of the French fleet, or you look at um, even a great recent example, the reactors that were just built in the United Arab Emirates. Um, building the exact same design. Uh, the Koreans do this really well. Um, but we weren't doing that in the United States. So that was a key lesson, standardization. Um, and then it was all about, though, the large kind of complexity that comes with, with when you make those kind of design changes. To make the economics work, you have to build them bigger and bigger and bigger. And then what you're getting into are power plants that cost tens of billions of dollars and take tens plus years to build. And at that stage, no one in the private sector capital markets can finance those projects. You're really left with governments. And then that's why you've seen the current nuclear sector, the current nuclear business model is essentially for government, government sales. And it's, it's, it's what happens in really all the really heavily complex infrastructure sectors. So, so you identified the problem. You identified that the only market really today was existing governments. Mm -hmm. How did you then devise the notion that like, okay, wait a second here, we could sell the private. There's an ability to adapt the technology and there's a market for this. How, how did you come upon that? Well, we, we start with like the, the idea of modularity. I'm sure most people in this class have kind of come across that in their studies from an academic perspective, right? But breaking down a complex problem into small bits, we did that on the technology side, right? So how can we essentially shrink down this technology to make it small enough that it can be privately financeable? And if it's privately financeable, then we can open up a whole new segment of customers, right? So there are plenty of, of uh, of customers, energy off takers, as we like to call them, that need um, you know a small amount of power. Not everyone can use a gigawatt of power, even at the country scale. You think about certain countries, you know, they're they're the size of states, right? Uh, that couldn't Singapore. use a nuclear. Singapore might be a good example, or countries in Africa, um, island nations, right? You, they can't use a gigawatt scale power plant, let alone an SMR size power plant, which is three small to five hundred, yeah, three to five hundred meg megawatts for a small modular reactor. They might need twenty, a hundred um, megawatts, and so if we can break it down into to a, a unit of, of about, that, about that size, then we can essentially scale up to meet the demand of a customer by building the number of 20 megawatt units that they need at their site. So when you identified this, did you come to a point where you could actually understand what the, what the monetization would look like, how much you know, potential revenue profit would come down the way, or is it just kind of a... We, we think there's a market there, we can break down the technology, we don't really know what kind of size of the market, but it's there. Yeah. You're really? getting at a really good distinction, which is that we ultimately have two customers. So we have the energy off takers that we sign PPAs with, but our real customer are the project investors in the actual, um, in the power projects themselves, right? So they're the ones who are investing in that asset and they get the return on the investment when we generate electricity. So I'm thinking that the next thing on the U of M campus is gonna be the Ross small modular reactor We'd that was bought. To. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so you identify the problem, you identify the market, you start to trudge forward in developing the technology, but as you're developing the market, or as you're developing the technology and exploring where to take this to market, you don't do it in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. You don't do it here where you both are, are living and where you're actually building these. You go overseas to Europe. Uh, why, how, and, and how was that process kind of yeah. decided? Yeah, so I, I mentioned climate change for me personally at the beginning, but I also mentioned it kind of as like a fundamental uh, you know, piece of how we were founded. I don't know if any of you 
did the read-aheads that Eric sent out, but if you did, you would have seen a talk on this exact stage in 2019 with our founder, Brett Kugelmas, um, back when we were the Energy Impact Center. So we spun last energy out of EIC. And uh, you know, that kind of approach and understanding of what is climate, how do we actually address it, um, you know, how can nuclear address that issue, that's what was really our foundation. Um, so, so yeah, so with that as kind of the impetus, we were looking at the time frame that we had to make an impact, right? Four years into my dream job in DC, I was frustrated because like the time frame of climate change is terrifying, right? And, and to make an impact at global scale, we don't, we need to be acting today. So that meant that we had to go to the markets where we could deploy the fastest first. So we first looked at, that kind of leads us to three key factors. We looked at tons of factors, but there's three overarching buckets, right? The first is, can you legally build it? <laughs> so there's only about 30 countries where Americans can ex American companies can export nuclear technology, so we started with those 30 countries. And then we looked at, is nuclear favorable in those countries? Is it legal to build it from that country's perspective? Um, and you know, is it of popular opinion with the governments. Um, that helped us narrow down even further, and then we started looking at the two key things that would enable us to go quickly. First is the economics, right? So um, is there going to be a customer base that is large enough for us to focus on this market first? And then the other most critical piece in this highly regulated industry is the nuclear regulatory paradigm. Um, so when you're innovating in a in a really well-established space with a highly re that's highly regulated, you want to ensure that your regulator is amenable to the approach that you're taking. So in the United States, um, the US, we have the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC. Um, abroad, there are similar um, institutions with, within each country. So what we did is we looked at all those regulatory bodies, and we looked at the ones that would be most in uh, amenable to our innovation approach by shrinking it down, making our systems um, simpler, uh, introducing new safety paradigms that, uh, at that size. So we looked at who we could go the quickest with. And, and students, for anybody out there who's like, I'm never gonna go into nuclear, this is way beyond me, this is not my area, it's not my passion, it's not my interest. That's not the point. The point is everything she's talking about, you can apply the same thinking of customer discovery, vehicles, mm -hmm. customer discovery, uh, and market validation, market intelligence, then weaning that down to profitability and monetization. Anything you go into, any business you start, those are the same concepts you're gonna be drilling down, okay? So think about it in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Going back to this notion of you identify the countries, you identify the governments that are amenable in the regulatory industries, as part of that, I'm sure you're hosting a lot of these people on the podcast yeah. and having very candid, open conversations yeah. with them and learning a ton along the way. It takes you over to decide that Europe is what's next. Yeah. And I want to skip to this one, actually. And so you go over to Europe and you go lead this out. Yeah, yeah. Which have you ever let out an international build out of a startup before? Is it? No. Yeah. No. It so was really how do you fun. do that? What happened? Yeah. So um, we, when we kind of got down to these four countries, uh, I had another opportunity to kind of focus exclusively on the United Kingdom. Um, and so I, I focused on that. Uh, building up that market, understanding kind of the opportunities in that space, ultimately hiring a really fantastic team that we now have out there. We have subsidiaries in all these countries as well with, with staff um, there. But you know, my role actually mostly became stakeholder relations with government. I was meeting with you know, the equivalents of their departments of energy, their you know, uh, parliamentarians, uh, number 10, um, and, and even local community stakeholders, local suppliers, um, and just you know, really looking at what were the opportunities, where were we going to build our first projects, who are our first customers going to be, and um, you know what that process was going to look like. Let's just pick that apart for a second. So the people you're meeting with are in a position to have tremendous influence, tremendous power, and you're really, it's an uphill battle you're trying to fight because it's something that's brand new. Everyone has some Godzilla-like fear of, inaccurately. What are the lessons learned from engaging with those folks? And as you're saying this, students understand this is the same parallel to how you're going to speak to investors or how you're going to speak to customers that are of that level that they could be tremendously impactful for the company you want to start. 
Yeah, well, one of the really great advantages that we had when it came to engaging with government is traditionally when a private sector company is coming to a government, they are looking for some sort of grant or subsidy, right? That's what you're there to lobby them for. That's not what we were there to do. We were essentially there to say, hey, we're going to take care of all the financing. We're you know, doing this through private sector means only. Um, but we just want to ensure that what we are putting together works with your ambition, works with your policy goals. So really framing kind of what we were there to do in a way that would support what the UK or Poland or Romania and the Netherlands um, are looking to decarbonize their industries um, and you know save jobs, um, uh, be kind of the, the technology superior, you know, they, they want to be. I mean, nuclear is a diplomatic tool um, as well. Um, so we definitely had challenges in that we, we weren't the United States government. They were used to dealing with government to government. And here we were, this small private company saying, we're going to build tiny nuclear power plants to help you decarbonize industry and put them all over the country. Um, so that's very different. But it, it took a lot of kind of very similar to how you have to you know, convince venture capitalists to get on the journey with you. We had to create this vision that these, these people really understood and show them how it would transform their economies um, and how it would you know, really bolster uh, kind of all, of all of their own ambitions. What are the keys to storytelling in doing that? What, what did you pick out that it was lesson learned? Oh, gosh. I mean... If you're ever going to be looking at international markets, there's a lot of cultural differences that you sh you should do your homework on. Um, but some lessons learned certainly, you know, uh, I would say one is is hire local people. Um, you know, I think once we started to hire our own, you know, London or Manchester, uh, you know, wherever they were based uh, staff, you know, these people have a much better cultural understanding of. of really literally everything, how people, how people speak, what they care about. Um, and that was a tremendous benefit to our team. And, and as we grow our international teams, we certainly see more success when it comes to relationship building and, and you know, really fostering like long-term beneficial relationships that kind of continue to give and give. Um, and then it also, even on the local level, right? Um, you know, some countries are uh, incredibly diverse in terms of their cultures. So if you're building a project um, in Wales or in Cumbria, it's to your advantage to hire local people who sound like they have a Cumbrian or have a Cumbrian accent or have a Welsh accent and can speak Welsh, right? Because you know, ultimately, especially when you know you're bringing in a technology that is in many ways could kind of define nimbyism. <laughs> um, you know, you, you want people there that can represent your business that ultimately can create a, a sense of trust um, with the community. Nuclear is a long-term relationship, right? I mean, our power plants will operate for more than 50 years before they're ultimately decommissioned. Um, you know, the staff that we have on the ground today will turn over many times. Um, and, and so you want to ensure that, you know, that you're creating that really strong sense of, you know, we are here for the long term. We are here to last, you know. Mm -hmm. And building upon that, you and I talked about this, uh, Brett's comment about the notion of, you're not trying to sell that you need to love nuclear energy. Everyone has to get on board with it being the ultimate solution. You're selling that it's cost effective. The rest yeah. will follow. Yeah. Well, I, I talked about the kind of the customer segment that we're targeting for our first deployments, right? Those are the guys who need an alternative to grid power. These, these people need base load power. It's a very different market segment from renewables, right? And they need it to be on site. They need heat as well. Um, and so we're able to base load meaning 24/7 yeah, constant firm, 24 always seven, available constant for you know constant manufacturing processes right so we found a really specific niche in this in this space where our first movers are and then um, you know obviously we'll be able to expand to folks who need different types of energy requirements but these are the people who need it the first are willing to move fastest. In addition to providing them the consistency and the reliability, it's also empowering them to meet the net zero pledges requirements mm -hmm. that all of the companies, of course, have started to come around to pledge to, to come mm -hmm. around and try to UN sustainability goals and the like. Well, it's, that's the difference in Europe, though. It's actually legally binding mm. <laughs> in Europe uh, to decarbonize. And um, you know, in Europe and in the United Kingdom, they have their own um, uh, goals there. So that's a big difference in the United States. We don't have a legally binding decarbonization mandate. Um, we have an, a, 
you know, abundant uh, natural gas resources. Uh, we have, you know, fit a ton of natural gas and, and uh, you know, fossil infrastructure, you know, trillions of dollars worth that not, isn't necessarily going to be going away anytime soon without major policy change. So that is another, like, big kind of driving force that makes Europe a, a, a more attractive market for us. It, the, the mandate that has been self-imposed, imposed by government, which is also a mandate that essentially feels like it led you into this career a mandate of that you wanted to have the biggest impact in the most quick way possible on uh, decarbonization and climate. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you're, the, the quote that you pulled here, as I was telling you earlier, was when I was kind of feeling very down. Um, but, you know, that's something that I learned early on with chemical engineering, right? So, like, there's chemistry, we're just you know, making you know, kind of small batches of, of things and more in the experimental phase, but then chemical engineering is, is producing you know, chemical products and chemical solutions at scale, like big manufacturing. My now husband, uh, you know, a boyfriend in undergrad worked in a chemistry lab and he would use like a pipette machine, right? And I had these big batch colanders and, and I really started to understand like scale because when you were doing an experiment and you only had you know, a little bit of, of material to use, if you wasted some, like it, it, it didn't really matter. But when you had you know, liters that you're pouring in, it, it makes a big difference. Um, so that also translates into economics. Economics, right? When you're thinking about the economics of scale, you know, traditional, uh, the traditional nuclear sector, when they focus on the reactor, they focus a lot on like small efficiency gains at that, at the react, you know, from the reactor and the turbine. But they don't really think about mass manufacturing, right? And how are we going to ensure that we can get efficiency gains throughout the entire process from the design through the the procurement processes through you know the way that these are um, literally assembled. We don't use any concrete in our plant, for example, right? So we do we make trade-offs that are all about that economics. At the end of the full power plant delivery process, we've reduced costs and we're able to scale from there, as opposed to it being the most efficient machine you could possibly design. And it wasn't because you otherwise were just all about nuclear from the onset of being in college, or just knew that that was the answer. It was that you had a self-imposed mandate. That that this is how you want to spend your 40 plus hours a week for your career to decarbonize and to help the greater problem that you had. And so you go to EIC and you talked about how every morning you spend an hour reading mm -hmm. to digest and understand and absorb everything it is that you didn't learn in school, you weren't taught, you haven't been around for 20 years. That is, that's incredible and it speaks to something else that I think we've talked about a lot this semester, which is what are you willing to suffer for? What are you so passionate about that you are willing to go ahead and put in that work and effort for? This is your passion? Yeah, yeah. I also often say that um, I'm now working to offset my own carbon footprint because I did not move to the UK. I just flew to the UK every, once or twice a month. Um, so, but yeah. I mean, I think, you know, if you, if you can find some mission that, that, you know, keeps you up at night, <laughs> um, that, you know, drives you mad, that that's, that's really exciting. Not... Not everyone's career, though, has to be like their everything. You know, there are people that they just want a nine to five, and you know, it's about family, it's about adventure, it's about travel, it's about hiking. And there's so many ways to live. But some of us kind of get this. I don't know if it's the entrepreneurial bug or it's just something else that drives you that becomes you become obsessed with solving it. Um, and that's something that I've been really impressed to, to witness in our founder. Uh, Brett is just such an inspiration to see him every day bouncing from topic to topic and, um, you know, being able to really focus on, on helping, you know, us achieve our mission. Uh, and, you know, and similar for me, it's about that, that broader impact that we can have. As we built this team, that's been one of the most exciting things for me to go from first employee to now, you know, pushing 70 employees. Um, it's just every single person that we bring on, obviously, you know, they bring new skill sets, new perspectives, new opinions that, that make what we are, you know, make our, our staff, make our, employee, our, our, our team just so much better. Um, and so, so you know, hypothetically, they go to apply for a job at Last Energy, they interview. What is the differentiating quality that's gonna make them stand out over everyone else? What is it that you're looking for in that team? What do you consistently try to source? Um, we like 
people who are comfortable with ambiguity. Every startup will say that. <laughs> um, but that is so true, right? Um, if you are going to be successful as a startup, moving fast is critical. If you are second place, it's equivalent to being last. Um, so <laughs> that means that you have to be comfortable pivoting. You have to be comfortable, um, you know, if, if you're... Uh, if you're working on something and suddenly our priorities change and everything you've worked on for the past four months is just scrapped, dust it off and keep going, right? Um, autonomy is critical, right? Like, can you just work on your own to solve problems, right? We, we, startups don't always have management structures. We certainly had pretty much no structure at the beginning, depending on the, the, the size that you are. Um, but, uh, you know, another core principle of ours is challenge culture, right? So we really like it when people are willing to, you know, fight for their own ideas, um, challenge each other, but then ultimately, once we've come to decisions, kind of say, okay, I made my piece, I argued as objectively as I could, but this is the direction we're going, I'm gonna fully commit to that direction until I have another opportunity to, to poke at it again. So those types of qualities. Okay, okay. Uh, taking that back to last energy itself, the notion of pivoting, the idea of dedicating the entire team effort rowing in the same direction when you do decide on a path. Right now, the path is dedicated to the four countries that you're in mm -hmm. over in Europe. Pivoting, potentially down the road, the idea of the U.S. market, the idea of what could happen here, I think about the data centers that are in place mm -hmm. all over the country and the like. Is there exploration of that going on right now? What does the timeline look like? Yeah, I mean, so ultimately, kind of, once we've proven out our tech in, in this, these four countries, um, it's all about scaling. So, our, you know, our first 10 units or so are going to be, you know, not as efficiently built. They're not, we're not going to have a gigafactory yet. But after that, you know, it's about vertical integration, gigafactory, really scaling for mass production. Um, and then it's about scaling to new markets. Um, so for us, it'll be going to the markets that make the most sense. Um, we'll see if the United States is the fifth country or the 20th country that we expand to. Obviously, we're all American. We'd love to be able to build in our own backyards. Um, but you know, ultimately, we'll, we'll be able to deliver really to any place that has the right infrastructure from the political standpoint it, as well. In, to that point about fifth or 25th, it feels like there's a changing mentality and, mm -hmm. and, and perspective of nuclear in the country right now. Is that the yeah. case? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, tell us about that. What's that? Five years about? ago when I started and I was telling people I was working in nuclear, they were like, what? Like, that's, I don't know about that. It's a dead industry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a dead industry. And then you get all the tr classic questions about waste and all this stuff, right? Um, but now I think what's what I've definitely noticed, um, you know, being a millennial in this space is there's, just, there's a lot more of us. Right, there's a lot more young people, people who came to nuclear from a similar path that I did, like through the climate or decarbonization space, like uh, kind of a, a perspective as opposed to just, oh, nuclear and rockets, like really cool technology. That's kind of how the, the previous generation maybe came to, to it, just to really like, it's, it's really cool technology. Um, but when you start to understand like the application and the massive global impact that some of these technologies can have, it gets you really excited. And you're seeing that with, with other technologies too in the clean tech sector. Um, but yeah, it's gaining momentum. And it's also, I think what we're proving is that it's gaining momentum as a potential solution at the, at the private sector scale, um, you know, mm -hmm. with, with all these agreements that we're signing. And, and I feel like one of the consistent hurdles, problems, issues with having it more widely adopted is always the notion of nuclear waste. What do you do with mm -hmm. it? Where do you store it? How do you end up keeping it, et cetera? Um, but we're not the only ones trying to solve that problem. Finland has, has taken a bit of a crack at that. Tell us a little bit, what's the insight yeah. there? What are they doing? Yeah, so, um, well, first I'll say, you know, nuclear waste is kind of a sovereign right to, to decide how a country is going to deal with with this uh, challenge. So Finland has made some decisions and there. They've built a geologic disposal facility. That's the same route that the United Kingdom is going. Um, in the United States, you've probably heard about Yucca Mountain. Um, so that's kind of a, a final geologic uh, repository. So that's one option that a nation can take when they're looking at how to dispose of, of spent nuclear fuel. Um, but what we've tried to do, to do, because we're not just designing for a single country, we're also designing, you know, a, a a operational paradigm and um, and a, a product that will last you know, 50 be to commission 50 years from now, so we won't really know what's going to be in place 50 years from now. So we're trying to design for optionality, right? So there's the 
there's this option. There's also, you know, countries might want to keep it on site, um, like we do here in the United States, right? So we have a solution for that. And of course, the other option is to reprocess, like they do in France and some other countries. So there's, that's also an option. So when we're looking at, you know, how we've designed our reactor and how we design for the eventual decommissioning of our power plants, we've ensured that from a technological standpoint, all three of these options, and even potential other ones that we haven't even thought of yet, um, are totally viable. So helpful to know. Um, one of those options that you talked about is that there's nuclear waste in an art gallery Yeah. over there. I mean, it, you know, upon initial blush being a total layman, I'm like, okay, I don't want to be around nuclear waste. That sounds horrible. I'm going to be harmed by this. Yeah, well, I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, when properly contained, um, you know, nuclear waste is, is not harmful. And this is... This is a, an incredibly impressive sector, right? These scientists have, um, you know, ensured that, uh, you know, like we, first of all, we know where all of our waste is. <laughs> Literally, we're the only industry that can claim that we know where every single ounce of spent nuclear fuel is. Um, you know, fossil industry can't, can't renewables uh, sector can't do that. And, you know, I think that we should really call that out as a, a major accomplishment for the mm -hmm. sector more. Um, but also, you know, we're able to store it in a way that's really safe. And in fact, it creates a lovely environment for preserving artifacts. Um, so there is a, an art gallery that has some of, you know, the most precious artworks, tapestries, um, that is also a nuclear waste you know, kind of intermediate storage solution um, that you can go and visit if you want to see art and also stand next to some spent fuel casks. That's what I plan to do on my weekends usually, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, students, I want to give you a chance to ask questions, so feel free to pop your hand up. We'll have some runners come out there. In the meantime, I want to kind of pose to you, we've got just like a minute here left. What are the leaders within this industry or even outside of it, what does everybody know but no one's willing to say? about nuclear. Oh gosh. Well, listen to the Titans of Nuclear podcast for a lot of those insights. But yeah. um, what does everybody know but isn't willing to say? Or what are people just too afraid to say generally about it? And if not that, then what's a myth to dispel? I would say that the nuclear industry in many ways has been its own worst enemy, which is hard to stomach, right? I just was uh, two seconds ago applauding this sector, right? But you know, we're the ones who have this technology and we're the ones who have to figure out how to deliver it to address this challenge. Um, and so it, it really is, it really is kind of up to this sector to, to fix some of the historical challenges. And that's why I'm so excited to see new people coming into this sector um, who, you know, are, are willing to push the boundaries and question the historical kind of frameworks that have kept it so stagnated. So goes the sector, so goes the world. So thank you very much, everybody. It will come up afterward. Okay, thank you. Have a good weekend.